For the last several Sundays, we've been talking about the glory of God and how God um, desires for His glory to be manifested through His people, for His glory uh, to be released through His people. And, uh, and we've, been, uh, we've said, last Sunday we said, that one of the, one of the uh, important requirements uh, to be a people who will manifest the glory of God is that we must be a holy people, a pure people. Purity is important. If we are going to be a people among whom God dwells and through whom His glory is manifested here on earth. And so I just want to dwell on that subject this morning. So let's begin by reading Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. It's again a very, very familiar verse, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, or pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Now he says, let's break this verse down. He says, I beseech you, I'm urging you, I'm requesting you, I'm pleading with you. Therefore, so somebody said, I heard this, actually it was Kenneth Hagin, I heard him say a long time ago, whenever you read therefore in the Bible, you've got to see why, why it is, what, how do you say, why it is therefore, right? So why did Paul say therefore? Because in Romans chapter 11, the previous chapter, Paul has just gone through talking to us about God's choosing of the nation of Israel. And he uses this analogy of an olive tree, of a, a cultivated olive tree and a wild olive tree. So he says, God has chosen, God chose the nation of Israel. But because of their unbelief and disobedience, he had to reject them. And then he took the branch of a wild olive tree that is, the Gentiles, and he grafted them into the original tree. But, he still will go back to Israel and finish what he started or purposed for them. That's basically the summary of Romans 11. If you pick up a couple of verses from Romans 11, uh, look at verses 19 and 19 to 22, I'm just picking up a few verses here. He says, You will say that branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. You mean to say, you know, God cut off the branches, the original tree, so that he could graft in the Gentiles? Verse 20, well said. Because of unbelief, they, that means Israel, the Jewish people, were broken off. And you, the Gentile, Stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, which is Israel, He may not spare you either. So it's like, like, don't get boastful now, just because you got in by faith, and they got rejected for a season. Don't boast about it, because if God dealt this way with the natural branches, he could very well deal with us who are the branches from outside grafted in. And then he says in verse 22, Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. So he kind of goes to this whole explanation of how God dealt with Israel and how for a season he cut them off and then he grafted in the Gentiles, the people of the rest of the world, he grafted them in to his purposes. 
And, uh, but he will not end that way with the Gentiles. He will bring up with the Jewish people. He'll bring them back. If you read on in verse 29, um, uh, uh, let's, let's look at verse 28 onwards. He said, Romans 11, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also but now also have now been disobedient, that through the most mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience. He left them, let them go into disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. So basically what he's saying is, look, at the end of it, God is going to have mercy on both the Jewish and the Gentiles. For a moment, when he was being severe with them, he extended mercy to the rest of the world. And then, now that he's extended mercy to the rest of the world, he's going to go back to the Jewish people and extend mercy to them as well. So we'll all be together, saved, is what he said. So when now when he, after he finishes all that teaching on how God dealt with the Jews and the Gentiles, he then brings in Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, in the light of what I have said, what? The goodness and the severity of God. Having understood how God deals with people, with his goodness and and a severity, I therefore beseech you. So now we understand why it's therefore. Because there is the goodness of God, but there is also the severity of God. It's two sides of the same coin. Knowing therefore the goodness of God and the severity of God, I beseech you, brethren. I want you to do this. Now, let me just point out a few things. It's a little aside here from the main message here. Three things about the severity of God. Now, God, God's severity is not like human temper. We lose our temper at the drop of a hat. God's not like that. He is good for a long time. He extends goodness. Long and then only after that does he step in to bring correction, judgment, or discipline. Then comes the severity of God. So the first thing with the severity of God, there is this time element. Everybody say time. time. The severity of God doesn't come the moment you and I do something wrong, otherwise we'll all be, you know, deep fried, <laughs> burnt. <laughs> pieces of dust already but we are not why because there is the goodness of God that endures through time before he can do something out of severity for example he's talking to one of the churches in the book of Revelation I'll just we'll skip that and we'll come back here to Romans 12 um, in Re Revelation uh, let me see Figure out which chapter this is in. Just give me a moment here. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. He's speaking to the church in Thyatira. He's talking about this particular church in Thyatira had a woman who's named here as Jezebel. She was a prophetess. This is in Revelation 2. Look, I'm looking at verses 20 and 21. And in the church, in the church, she was causing God's people to commit immorality and drawing them astray. And notice what he says in verse 21. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not. So can you imagine this? God's looking at this church. He's seeing all this nonsense going on in it. 
and he doesn't press the red button, fire and brimstone. <laughs> he doesn't do that. What does he do? He says, I gave her and the church time to repent. Meaning, in my goodness, I continue to bless them, bless their ministries, bless all the things they're doing, even though I am seeing that there is wrong stuff going on. I gave them time to repent. But they did not. So now, it's time to press that button, to bring in some correction, to bring in the severity of God, and, and, and to take correction, corrective measure for their deeds. So, going back to Romans 12, 1. Romans 12. I beseech you, brethren, therefore, Understand the goodness and severity of God. The severity of God comes after a long time. The second thing about the severity of God is that whenever God is being severe on one side, there is always a transfer of goodness on the other side. So say the words transfer. And God was being severe with the Jews. He was transferring goodness to the Gentiles. So it's two sides of the same coin. And God may deal severely with one, there's actually a transfer, a release of goodness to a whole lot of other people. So when somebody is being dealt out of the severity of God, understand that God is actually releasing goodness, His mercies. To someone else in the background. Somebody else is being touched by the goodness of God. So it's not like God saying, I've lost my, I've lost it, man. I'm in bad mood now. No, no, relax. There's just a transfer of goodness. Somebody else is getting it because you didn't want, you rejected it. God was patient, waiting for you to change. You didn't want it. The goodness is going, reaching out to somebody. The third thing about the severity of God is that it is not terminal. So say, not terminal. Meaning, just because God deals with us out of severity, it doesn't mean it's the end of the road. God dealt with the Jewish people with severity for a season, but it doesn't terminate their God's plan for their lives. Because Romans 11, 29, that we just read, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Amen? Just because God deals with you in severity at a particular season because He needs to bring some correction, some change in certain things in your life, doesn't mean He terminates His purposes for you. Amen? It's not terminal. Because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He will not change his mind on whom he chooses and whom he calls. He will not change that. Amen? Amen. So now let's get back to Romans 12.1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, understanding the goodness and the severity of God, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by the compassions of God, I'm doing this very compassionately, Paul is saying, what? Present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. Holy and pleasing to God. Which is your reasonable, rational, logical service. So some translations put it as worship. So this whole act or practice of me presenting my body as a living sacrifice to God so that it can be holy and pleasing to him Paul calls it my reasonable act of worship my logical act of worship so let's just dwell on the last part and then set focus in on the middle part of that verse so this this process of me presenting my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, is an act or a form of worship. So, 
We worship God through song. Wonderful. We worship God through our giving. Wonderful. But here's another very important way to worship God. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is a logical way to worship God. Amen? So understand that there are many ways to worship God. Singing songs and praises is one of them. Giving is another. But presenting our bodies to God. In such a way that it is holy and pleasing. Is also our act of worship to Him. Worship is really you telling God. How much He means to you. Amen? Please understand that worship is by no means stroking God's ego. God, you're such a nice God. Yes, tell me more about it, you know. God does not need his ego to be stroked. God does not need any kind of affirmation from human beings. Amen? Human beings need affirmation. God doesn't. Worship is me telling God what He means to me. So when I worship God this way, by presenting my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Him, I'm telling God, God, you mean a lot to me. That's why I'm doing this. It's my act of worship to God. So now, let's talk about this aspect of presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. You know, holiness and purity has to be in all three dimensions of our being. It has to be in our spirit, has to be in our soul, in our thought, and in our body. This morning, we want to dwell on the body part of it. We're not talking about the spirit. Spirit, you need to keep your heart clean of all kinds of wrong attitudes and uh, other cleanse. Like 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. So there's holiness in the spirit as well. Maintaining a pure heart, keeping it clean of, of wrong attitudes, of jealousy, of pride, arrogance, all those kinds of things. That's holiness on the inside. Holiness of the mind, keeping your thoughts clean and pure. But here, we're dealing with the holiness of the body. The outer man. So Paul says, present your bodies. As a living sacrifice. Meaning, sacrifice is not always easy to do. There is pain involved. That's why it's called sacrifice. But he says you present your body as a living sacrifice in such a way that your body becomes holy and pleasing to God. This is your act of worship to God. So I want to deal with this aspect this morning. I want to talk about it a little bit more and how Present, how do we present our body as a living sacrifice? I want to deal with two areas. First, I want to deal with our conduct. And second, I want to deal with our sexuality. These are two big areas in which we struggle when it comes to presenting our body as a living sacrifice. So we're going to talk about that. So in our conduct... I need to consciously present my body as a living sacrifice so that it can be holy and acceptable to God. The way I conduct myself, what I do with my body has to be holy and pleasing to God. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. 
We're going to read from verse 17 to 32 on. I'll just read this whole passage here because Paul is uh, kind of spelling out in very, very literal terms how a believer has to go live. What is the conduct of a believer? And through this, we are presenting our body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Next Sunday, we'll kind of talk about the how to make it happen part with the help of the Holy Spirit. But this morning, I want to just help us understand some of the standards God has set for us. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 onwards. This I said, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. He says, believers, don't walk like the rest of the unsaved people. Don't pattern your living after them. They are walking in the futility or the vanity of their mind. Whatever they can imagine, they'll go out and do. But you don't imitate that. Verse 18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So he says, look, don't behave like the Gentiles, the unsaved people. They are alienated from the life of God. They have no experience of the, of the life transforming power of God. Their minds are darkened. They cannot, they don't see the truth. And they have given themselves over to work all manner of uncleanness with greediness. Meaning there's no limit to what evil they wish to do. So don't be like them. You have not so learned Christ. Don't follow the world. Don't follow their standards. Don't follow their lifestyle is what Paul is teaching us. Then he says, verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct. So he's dealing with conduct. This is that aspect of our lives where we present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable. So he's dealing with conduct. Put off concerning your conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit or the attitude of your mind that you may put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Put on the new person. You are a new person on the inside. Let it show out in your conduct. Are you with me so far? We are born again. We are brand new on the inside. Put on the new man that you have in your spirit. This new man is created in the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. The new person that you became has the capacity, has the potential to walk in righteousness and holiness. Now Paul is saying, you put, on, put him on in your conduct. Put him on. And then he begins to spell it out for us. Verse 25. Conduct. Therefore, putting away, lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Okay. He is getting it, getting it down to practical things. How do I present my body as a living sacrifice to God that is holy and pleasing to Him in my conduct? He says, get rid of... Guys, you want to come with me or not this morning? <laughs> get rid of... Lying. Get rid of putting away... Lying. Speak the truth with one another. So when you speak the truth, when you choose not to lie, what are you doing? You're worshipping God. You are presenting your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. You're saying, God, you mean so much to me that even in my speech, I want to honor you. Put up a line. Verse 26. Be angry. This is one place the Bible says, be angry. For what purpose? So that you don't sin. Be angry and do not sin. Okay? 
you are so intolerant towards sin that you refuse to sin. That's what you've got to be angry about. Be angry and do not sin. Get agitated. Be intolerant towards sin. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let, down, let the sun go down on your anger. Nor give place. Now let me just read it because if we read, if we kind of break every verse down, it's going to take us a long time. But I want you to just go through this whole conduct here. Nor give place to the devil. Don't give the devil any space in your life. Let him who stole steal no longer. But rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it, it may impart grace to them. Yes. Let's be careful how you talk. Don't let any loose word come out of your mouth. See, that's your act of worship. You're presenting your body as a living sacrifice that will be holy and acceptable to God. How? When you refuse to let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but your standard of communication is, I want to speak things that are good, that's going to lift people up, that's going to edify, that's going to bring grace to the hearers. Verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgive you. Therefore be, chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints, nor filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ, and God. So this is our conduct. So just keep your life clean. Don't speak idle words. Don't get into chuma joking. Now. See, have fun in life, but be careful. Right? You start. He calls it like foolish jesting. Now you know Abel is a stand-up comedian, so he can make us all laugh, and you know, that's okay. I mean. But when we sit down and start, you know, just wasting our uh, time and foolish talking and jesting and, 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 and idle talk, he says, you know, that conduct doesn't fit those who are called saints. Now, when you as a believer choose to stay away from that kind of conduct, what are you doing? You're actually worshiping God. You're presenting your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Amen? When you choose to speak words of grace, when you choose to speak words that edify people, when you refuse to steal, when you refuse to lie, rather you choose to work with your own hands and so that you can bless others for that. All these things he talks about concerning our conduct. This is us presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice that it might be holy and pleasing to God, which is my act of worship to God. Amen. So we need to constantly be on guard over our conducts. Because through our conduct, we can worship God if we choose to. Through our conduct, throughout the course of the day, throughout the course of the week, and whatever you might do as a student in your school or college, in your place of work, 
when you choose not to do, do things that are improper, that are not pleasing to God, each time you refuse, you're offering up worship to God. So you can actually be worshipping God throughout the day, even when you're not singing a song. How? Through your conduct. You can actually be worshipping God throughout the day, even when you may not be necessarily praying a prayer. How? Through your conduct. Because it is, as you present your body moments by moment, as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God, in your conduct, you're offering up your reasonable worship to God. So are you a worshiper? I'm not talking about somebody who can sing songs. I'm talking about somebody who worships God by presenting their bodies as a living sacrifice. Amen? The second aspect I want to deal with here, with our bodies, as we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God, is this whole area of our sexuality. Now, some facts, the fact is that God designed our sexuality. Do you agree with me or not? Yeah, God designed it. So it's a good thing. It's God's idea. Our sexual desires and appetites and all of that is, is part of who we are. God designed it. And therefore, it is something that's, that ought to be pleasing to God when exercised correctly. However, the fact is that all of us struggle with this. And I want you to know that just because you become spiritual, your sexuality doesn't disappear. Amen? Just because you start praying a lot doesn't mean you morph into an angel. <laughs> Serious. Some people think, holy man of God. Yeah? He might be praying a lot and reading the word a lot, but he's still in a body. And as long as you are in a body, your body has sexual passions and desires. So just because somebody's spiritual, don't think they are not sexual beings. They are, as long as they're in the body. Amen? <laughs> Do you agree with me or not? Yes. Amen? Yes. All right, let me ask Abel. Abel is a worship leader. Abel. <laughs> Honest. Just because you pray, just because you read the Bible, just because you pray in tongues, doesn't make your sexuality disappear. <laughs> right? And the fact is that no one has a clean record in this area. Not even me. I don't have a clean record. I have struggled. I've had to find my way through this whole thing of, God, how do I manage and how do I master my own sexuality? How do I keep it in a way where I can then offer my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you? And I need to do it every day. It's not like I pressed one button, pushed it, it's forever settled. No. Every day, on a daily basis, I have to walk this walk. Just because I'm a pastor, doesn't mean all sexual feelings go away. No, it doesn't. You're in the body, and that area of our lives must also be offered to God as a living sacrifice. And when you, by the grace of God, and we'll talk about this next Sunday, how to do it, when you, by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit, manage and master, master and manage your sexuality, so that your body is then holy and pleasing to God, what are you doing? 
You're worshipping So do you know, you can worship God even in the area of your sexuality. So, Pastor, I never heard that before. No, you just heard it. Because God designed it for you and me. And if we master, if we keep it in the right place, what are we doing? We are worshiping God even in that realm. And that's so important when it comes to the body. And we talk about lying and stealing and, you know, don't, get, don't swear and all those things. I mean, yeah, all that's important. But then there's one area of our lives that all of us struggle with, whether you're a man or woman, we all struggle with it. And that's the area of sexuality. And God has given us instructions what to do. I want to talk about some of those things. Well, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. So you can be human. You don't have to be very saintly now. Just joking here. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, we'll read verses 1 through 8. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 1 through 8. Finally then, brethren... We urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. So again, he's talking about conduct, how you should walk and please God. So we're talking about offering our bodies a living sacrifice so that it will be holy and pleasing to God. He's telling us about it in practical ways. Verse 2. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That means anything wrong, doing anything. When you read the word sexual immorality, don't only really just think about you know adultery and prostitution, this kind of thing. You know anything wrong, anything that I do wrong with my sexuality. Something immoral, something not right with the area of my sexuality. So he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. God wants you to be sanctified. The word sanctified is a big word. simply means to be set apart for holy use. Or simply means be holy. So this is the will of God. That you should be holy. You should be consecrated unto the Lord. And he says, especially in the area of your sexuality, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, from anything that is wrong that in the area of your sexual passions. Verse 4, that each of you should know how to possess, how to master and manage his own vessel, meaning his own body, in sanctification and honor. Each one of us should know so, Pastor, why are you talking about this in church? Because the Bible says each one of you should know. <laughs> right? I have a special seminar, managing your sexuality seminar. <laughs> Don't do it Sunday morning, Pastor. Listen, the Bible says each one of you should know. If you have a seminar, each one of you won't come. <laughs> so, Pastor, I'll do it on Sunday morning, and everyone shows that. That each one of you should know. We got to learn. See, this doesn't come automatic. You're not born with this ability. None of us are born with it. So we got to learn what? How to possess his own vessel. And how to master and manage your own body in sanctification and honor in a way that is holy and pleasing to God, honorable before God, is what he's telling us. Verse 5, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. In other words, in this area, don't go to the Gentiles for advice. Okay, don't follow them. You can't take their example. You can't tell them how to teach you to manage your body. Don't go to them for instruction. Not in the passion of lust. Don't follow their example like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. 
because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also for want you and testified. Verse 7, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore he rejects this, does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So it says, don't reject what I'm saying right now. You know, if you ever reject this, this is, you're rejecting God himself, and he has given to us his Holy Spirit. So learning to manage, or learning how to possess our vessel, our body, in a way that is holy and pleasing to God. We must learn how to do that. Because God has not called us to uncleanness or living an immoral, sexually impure life. But he's called us to holiness, sanctification, and honor even in this area. Amen? So, let's break it down now. How do I present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him, in this area of my sexuality? Now, I want to just break it down and talk about some very practical things here. One area that, that we need to understand and we need to master and manage ourselves is in the area of lust, is in the area of uh, fantasies and what goes on in your desires. You know, we're all human beings and there are many wonderful, handsome men and beautiful ladies sitting in this hall here. And it's natural for when a man sees a beautiful girl or, you know, a good-looking girl, his passions are aroused. Men, <laughs> you can tell me in Hindi in case they don't speak code language. <laughs> it's normal. Right? That's, the way, that's what happens. I mean, unless you've just been transfigured or something. <laughs> That is normal. Now, the, as a believer, you, know, you see this good-looking girl, or now same thing happens for girls, ladies too, right? I think so. <laughs> now, you look at the opposite gender, and you say, wow, he's a good-looking guy, whatever. Same thing happens. Your emotions are stirred, and you like, wow, whatever. But. And, and there is nothing wrong in appreciating beauty. Beauty is an expression of the holiness of God. Beauty is an expression of the holiness of worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Okay? Beauty and holiness are connected. There's nothing wrong in appreciating beauty, the appreciating the excellence and the quality of whatever God's done. I mean, it could be the human being, it could be the beautiful night sky, it could be a beautiful, uh, you know, scene of the hills and the valleys, rivers, whatever. When you see beauty, it's expressing the glory of God. There's nothing wrong. So you haven't sinned, I haven't sinned, we haven't sinned when we appreciate somebody's as long as you can see God in it and say God thank you thank you but where do we sin it's what Jesus told us in uh, Matthew 5 you know we should go there so Matthew chapter 5 Matthew chapter 5 Verses 27 onwards. Matthew 5, 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you will not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman, see, looking at a woman is not wrong. What happens after that? Whoever looks at a woman to lust after, her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What is lust? It's a desire to possess. It's a desire to have an experience. That's lust. So whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery. So let's have a stoning service. Everybody line up and stone all of you. All of us. 
Because by this verse, all of us, including me, have sins. Amen? Please pray for me. <laughs> because what Jesus said. If you look at a woman to lust after her, the desire to do, as far as God is concerned, as far as God, not even man, as far as God is concerned, the desire to do, the uncontrolled passion to commit, is equivalent to committing the act, as far as God is concerned. You are with me? With me so far? So who looks at a woman to last after has committed a adultery with her already in his heart? If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Let's pass the offering bucket. <laughs> if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into. Now you know that Jesus is not talking about us doing it literally. Right? He's talking about, look, if something in you that's really close to you, is part of you, part of you your eye, your hand, is causing you to sin, you need to amputate it. You need to deal with it severely. That's being a living sacrifice. So, Pastor, is there any other way? I mean, can you cast the devil out? Can you anoint me? To live? No, no, no. You have to go through amputation. <laughs> we'll have an amputation service at the end. <laughs> it's wondering, you know, everybody has anointing service. Deliverance service. We do an amputation service. Amen. I'm serious. Worship team, be ready, right? <laughs> so he says, if something in you causes you to do something wrong, is leading you astray, you have to deal with it with severity. So question, whose severity do you want? Do you want to deal with it severe, severely yourself? Or do you want to continue in it until God says, I've given time to repent, but they have not. Now it's time for me to deal with it in severity. So he gives us the option. You deal with it first. right? So, so here's an area that we all struggle. Understand the standard of God. God's standard is, look, it's not right to go lusting after. Say, but I'm not hurting him or I'm not hurting you. I'm not doing anything wrong. Listen, in God's standard, the desire to do is equivalent to committing. The desire to commit is the same as committing. And so I have to deal with it at the level of desire and not think I'm okay just because I'm not committing the act. It's not okay. Amen? So I say, okay, how do I deal with it? Here's how I deal with it. And you can find, you'll find different ways in which God will help you deal with it. One thing I do often, whenever I come into these moments where I'm struggling with, uh, uh, where I'm uh, struggling in an area where I need to manage and master my sexuality, I, I declare Jesus as Lord over my sexual feelings. Declare Jesus as Lord over my sexuality. Jesus, you are Lord over the sexual part of me. This, you reign, you rule in this area of my life as well. Another thing I do is I consecrate. I say, Lord, my sexuality is consecrated to you. I consecrate it. I set it apart for the Lord. So when, a negative, when an evil thought comes, when anything evil comes, I can respond by saying, my sexuality is consecrated to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you consecrate it. So Lord, this is yours. 
You gave it to me, I consecrate it to you. Because my desire is to present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So I consecrate my sexuality, I consecrate my sexual desires, I consecrate my sexual feelings and passion. God, I consecrate it. They are for the Lord and not for sin. They are for the Lord and not for immorality. Right? Another third important thing that, that helps me here is to use the word of God to control the thought. If you can control the thought and stop it at the level of thought, you won't have to struggle with the desire. Because the thought creates an imagination. The imagination stirs up desire. And the desire weakens the will. And that's when sin comes. So the moment the thought comes, deal with it. Having a thought come to you is not the same as thinking evil. The different things. An evil thought comes. If you deal with it, it's stopped right there. But if you entertain it and continue thinking evil, that's when you're sinning against God. Amen? So how do you deal with it? I use the word of God. I use Matthew 5. Whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery. I say, I refuse to lust after her. I refuse to lust after her beauty. Thank you, God. Praise the Lord for that. I don't say it loudly. It's in my heart. God, thank you. But this is where it will stop. Some other scriptures I use. You can take it down. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 25. Proverbs 6, 25 says... Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, neither let her allure you with her eyelids. Proverbs 6.25, do not lust after her beauty in your heart. So I just tell myself, this is the word of God, God's word says, I should not lust after her beauty in my heart. I will not let her take me with her eyelids. Protect her. Proverbs 31. So how do, you know all, how do you know all these verses? Because I use them a lot. Proverbs 31, verse 3. Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. You stand on guard. You're keeping yourself in this area of, of, of lust. For those who are married, Job chapter 31. Job 31 and verse 1. Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Job 31 verse 1. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I gaze upon a young woman? So what happens? When the thought comes, when this thought that could possibly lead you into sin through lust, you've got to stop it right there. The same thing with you ladies, you know. Same principle. Stop the thought before it becomes lustful thinking. Amen? The second area in, in, in dealing with our sexuality is... The indirect fulfillment of sexual desires. The indirect fulfillment of sexual desires through other means. Like pornography. That you watch. And it could be on television. It could be on the internet. It could be through magazines and so on. This is an indirect gratification of sexual desires. And even in this area... We must learn how to possess ourselves in holiness and in a way that's pleasing to God. Now this whole thing of pornography, you know, nobody's going to be watching you. It happens in private. And it can happen when you are doing something as simple as reading a newspaper. Right? Because it comes to you, delivered at your doorstep. You don't even have to turn the computer on. 
you get times of India, you know what I'm talking about. I have found a lot of the other newspapers, magazines that that are just uh, aside from the actual contents that you want to read, there's all these distractions sitting on the side. So even reading a newspaper is difficult. Or for that matter, if you take a drive down MG Road or something. A lot of these advertisements these days have sexual connotations and all those kinds of things. And so it's difficult. Now if I fulfill my sexual desires indirectly through pornography and these kinds of things, it's still wrong. Now we may say, well, you know, I'm not hurting anybody. It's not the question whether you're hurting somebody or not. The question is, is this holy and is it pleasing to God? Amen? First Thessalonians chapter 5. We were there in chapter 4. So we go back to First Thessalonians chapter 5. And verse 22. First Thessalonians 5, 22. He says, Abstain from every form of evil. Abstain, stay away from every form of evil. With all appearance of evil. He says, you stay away from it. Pornography is addictive and holds the individual as a slave. So why is it wrong? Because you're a slave. And Jesus didn't come to get slaves. He came to set us free. To live free from every lawless deed. Amen? So even in this area of pornography, we need to keep, we need to know how to possess, how to master and manage our sexuality so that it can be pleasing and honorable before God. And you need to have some practical ways by which you protect yourself. For example, when you're reading the newspaper, you can't avoid your eyes from having a first look at something there. So you know, when you turn the pages there, you see it. You can't prevent it. But the moment you know there is a, a, a picture that's, that's not right, you shouldn't be looking at it, what do you do? That's the important part. Do you go back to stare? Or do you choose just to read the news and turn the page? And this is where we exercise self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is Self-control, self-governing ability. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of the real Greek word there is discipline. Some of your Bibles may translate it self-control. The Holy Spirit empowers us for discipline. So I didn't know that about the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about it next Sunday. The Holy Spirit empowers us for discipline. The Spirit whom God has given us is a spirit of love, of power and of discipline. The strength of your discipline comes from the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, good discipline. I see something, I can't avoid it. It's in the magazine or it's in the newspaper. But turn the page. Or read the news that you need to read. Turn the page. If you're watching television, it's an understood thing in our family. When you're watching television, you're watching that part that you want to watch, and then in between comes a commercial break. And almost every commercial break, there is something not nice, to put it politely. And the moment something not nice comes on this screen, turn it off. It's going to take about a minute to turn it off, whatever time. Same thing on the internet. Best way to avoid pornography on the internet is not even go down that side. Don't go to those sites. 
but you know things are going to be bad. Just stay with what you need, you know. But sometimes, even when you go on YouTube to watch Pastor Ashish, <laughs> on the side comes another picture that doesn't look like him. <laughs> and you tend to get attracted to that picture more than listening to the sermon. And you can't help it. You went to watch the sermon that you missed, you know. But YouTube deserves this up to you. So what do you do? Enlarge past ashes. <laughs> Make it full screen. Say no thank you to the other advertisement that comes up. Whatever. But you make a choice. I'm going to stare at it. And you can't prevent it from coming. I mean, you were innocently going to listen to Sunday's sermon. That came up. You can't prevent that. But what you do next is very important. And that's where you need discipline. It comes with the strength of the Holy Spirit to say, no thank you, I don't want this. Get it out. But, you say, yeah, that's interesting. Let me click there. You missed the sermon. You're off on another track right now. That's dangerous. So in this whole realm of pornography, you and I need to master ourselves. Now, some of you married people, some of us married people, you know, may say, you know, I'm not being fulfilled. I'm not being satisfied in my marriage. So I need this as a way of being satisfied. You know, these are excuses that come. But that's when you need to bring yourself to the Word of God. And say, what does the word of God tell me? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 5. And just look at two scriptures here. Proverbs chapter 5. I know most of what I'm saying is directed to women, but uh, to, towards men. But women, you're permitted to listen and, and apply it to yourselves. Proverbs chapter 5. Verse 15 on. I'm talking to married men here. It says in verse Proverbs 5.15, Drink waters from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed. The fountain representing children coming off your offspring. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and as a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? So what's he saying? He's saying, you drink waters out of your own cistern. Let your quench your own thirst at your own well. Don't go looking for it elsewhere. He says, let your wife, let her breast satisfy at all times, be and always enraptured with her love. Your fulfillment as a married man should be in your wife. And in case you're not satisfied, your only option is to derive your fulfillment from God. Pornography is not an option. Going to another woman is not an option. Amen? Malachi chapter 2. I'm out here, Malachi chapter 2, and again, most of you know that passage of scripture, but I want to highlight something. Malachi chapter 2. Verse 14 says, Malachi 2, 14 onwards. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Then did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. 
Therefore take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. What does he say? Second part of verse 15. Watch over your own spirit, guard over your own self. Let no one deal treacherously, betray trust. Let no one break faith. Let no one be unfaithful to the wife of his What must you do? Guard your spirit. It's in the word. So if you say, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel satisfied inside my own marriage for whatever reason, listen. The Bible doesn't give you much of an option. Either you're satisfied with the wife of your own youth, you drink waters from your own system, always be uh, enraptured with, your, with her own love, or you derive your satisfaction and fulfillment from God. Ultimately, that is where all of us must go. Amen. And in the process, he says, God, your spirit. God, your emotions. God, yourself. Don't permit yourself to be faithless to your wife. Pornography will take you down that path. So guard your spirit. Amen? Got five more minutes. So we're talking about presenting your body as a living sacrifice, being holy. And acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. We talked about our conduct very briefly. We're spending a lot of time on the area of our sexuality because all of us, men and women, struggle in this area. I want what I want you to go away with this morning is look, you can worship God even in the area of your sexuality. If you will consecrate it to the Lord, if you will Keep that area. You will master and manage that area as God wants you to do it. It can be a beautiful area where you can worship God. Amen? The last thing I want to deal with in the area of our managing our sexuality is a common question all of us ask, and that has to do with masturbation. Everybody asks that same question, or many ask, is it right? Is it wrong? Uh, you know, I'm not hurting anybody. Uh, what should I do? And, and I must admit, you know, there are differing views, even from Christians, on, on this whole subject. And, and you listen to what believers say, you listen to what medical doctors say about masturbation, and you, know, and, and, and you try to arrive at some conclusion. But here is what my stand is. If you will go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now Paul is talking about, in this passage, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20. And I'm going to read just verse 12. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. Paul says, in this whole passage, verses 12 to 20, he's talking about glorifying God in body and spirit. And I'll read verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So here's my stand, and, and uh, you could agree with me, you could disagree with me, doesn't matter, I'm just talking about it because people ask the question. My stand is, I refuse to practice it, simply because I do not want to be brought under the power of anything. If it controls me, if it's a habit I cannot resist, I am a slave to it. It might be lawful, but is it helpful? It might be lawful, but is it controlling me? Or am I controlling it? Who is the master? Is the question. So my stand on it is, I refuse to practice. Because I refuse to let my body be mastered by anything else. My sexuality is consecrated to the Lord. I will master and manage my sexuality so that it is holy and pleasing to the Lord. Amen? 
Let's send to our fleet. We're going to have a, what do we call it? Amputation service. <laughs> Let's stand to our feet, please. This morning, I just, worship team, you can come up. I just feel that we should act on this word. He says, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. Present your body as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. In your conduct, be holy, be pleasing to God. It is our act of worship. In mastering and managing this whole area of sexuality, which all of us struggle with, I want to be holy and pleasing to you. So this morning, as we stand here, this is going to be a holy moment. Malachi says, Malachi chapter, I think it's chapter 4. God says, I will sit as a refiner and a purifier of my people. So here's how I pray. I say, Holy Spirit, let your fire burn in me to burn up all any and all unclean passions, all unclean desires. Let the fire burn. The Holy Spirit, our God is a consuming fire. Jesus said he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. The fire is there to burn up the child. The fire is there to burn up anything that's not right, anything that's, not in, not, that's unclean. That's why the fire is there. So I pray, I say, Lord, let the fire of your spirit burn me. To burn up the chap, burn this up, Lord. And this morning, I want to invite you just to pray and say, God, I want to offer up my body, my body, as a living sacrifice that will be holy and pleasing to you. It will be holy and pleasing to you. take some time to pray right now as you're standing here. The message here is not to condemn, but the message here is to set us free. The message here is not to tell you you're a sinner. The message here is to tell you you're a saint and you can walk in liberty because Christ has set you free. The message here is not to drive you away from God is to invite you closer to Him. To walk closer to Him. So that we could all be holy and pleasing to God. All of us struggle. All of us go through challenges. But there's God to help us and give us strength. So would you take some time to pray right now and say, God, come help me.
continue talking about some of these things next Sunday. We talk about how to draw the strength of the Holy Spirit to keep our body in subjection. We'll take this further next Sunday. But I, I don't want you to leave this place thinking you're condemned or judged. Or, but rather I want to invite you and me to journey into greater levels of holiness and being pleasing to God. Amen. I want to let us know there is grace. There is empowering grace that God gives to each one. Amen. That none of us, none of us need to be in bondage to anything because there is the grace of God that sets us free from every lawless deed. There's that empowering grace. And all we have to do is say, God, give me grace. Give me more grace. Give me greater strength to pursue holiness and be pleasing to you in my body. I want to take a moment to pray. I know you already prayed, but just take another moment right now just to pray and say, God, give me the grace that I might offer my body as a living sacrifice. So it will be holy and pleasing to you. And this is my act of worship to you. Holy Spirit, we just invite you. You are the Spirit who sets us free. Lord, we thank you for your word. You said, how shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to your words. Lord, we've heard your word. and. We welcome the cleansing power of your word. We welcome the liberating power of the Holy Spirit. In every life, Lord, in every one of us, each one of us, that we will know how to possess our own vessel, how to possess our own body in sanctification and honor and holiness and honor before you. Come, Holy Spirit, and empower every individual here empower every individual here help us to walk in greater levels of holiness help us to walk in greater levels of sanctification and honor before god lord god everything that's not of you cut it off oh god help us to pluck it off of our beings that we might truly be living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable to god lord in our conduct if any one of us are used to lying or God in some form of stealing or, or lose communication or, or, or whatever form of uh, unrighteousness in our conduct. Come Holy Spirit, sift it out, take it out, burn off of our lives, Holy Spirit, that we might be a living sacrifice to our God. Lord, in the area of our sexuality, empower us by your grace that to master and manage this, Lord, what you've given each one of us to master it and manage it and keep it as a place where we would worship you with it. Empower each one, Holy Spirit. And we just thank you, God. We worship you and we honor you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Before we close this morning, if there's anyone here and you've never received Jesus into your heart, into your life, I just want to pray with you before we close. The Bible says, Jesus says, you know, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will come in. I will live with him and he'll live with me. So Jesus stands at the door of our hearts and he says, I want to come in. I want to live in you. I want to forgive your sin. I want to make you a brand new person. I want to set you free. He wants to come into our lives. The Bible says anyone who receives him to them, he gives them the power.
to become children of God. If you will receive Jesus Christ, He makes you a child of God. Something that no religion can give you. No one else can do that for you. So if there's anyone here this morning, you've never received Jesus into your life. You've never experienced this of being forgiven, of being made a child of God. I'd like to pray with you right now before we close. So if you take a moment just to close your eyes and bow your heads with me, please. Is anyone here who never received Jesus into your life? They say, I want Jesus to come in. I want to become a brand new person. Could you pray this prayer with me, please? Just repeat it after me as a sign of your decision. To say this to me, Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. I believe you died for my sins. And that you rose up again. And you're alive today. I receive you as the Lord and Savior of my life. Help me to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody here, you prayed the prayer for the very first time this morning. You repeated after me. You prayed this prayer. Could you put your hand up, please? Anybody here, you prayed this prayer for the very first time. Let me just see your hand. Anybody? You prayed this prayer for the very first time. Could you just lift your hand up? It's a sign that you prayed this prayer with me. Anybody up on the balcony? Okay, I don't see any hands up. But if you did, I just want you to come and meet with me before you leave. We have a little New Testament to give you a few instructions on how you can grow in your walk with God and your life with Jesus. Amen? Are you happy you came? Present your body as a living sacrifice that's holy and pleasing to God. And it's your act of worship to God throughout the day. God bless you all. Have a great week. And we'll see you again next Sunday at... St. Joseph's European High School. God bless you. Have a great day.